Hello and welcome to Inequality Talks, a podcast from the volunteers of the Economic Equality Group at Mellenfogelijk Samenwerken Orde. In each episode of Inequality Interviews, we interview experts in a field or topic related to economic equality. Today we'll be talking about the problem of food waste and how policies can support alternatives that try to address this problem. One such alternative is the NGO Skalde Café, which works tirelessly to fight food waste in Denmark. Amrit Jorgensen, who started the organization, is with us today to help us move on, move one step closer to understanding the complexities of food policies in Denmark. This episode is made as part of the Our Food, Our Future initiative. The initiative, co-funded by the European Commission, is an international coalition of civil society organizations working towards changing the global food system to be sustainable and socially just. In Our Food, Our Future Denmark, we try to bring issues of food justice to the forefront of public debate. Food waste is a crucial topic when we discuss food justice, especially when we talk about the amount of food that is wasted up against the number of people suffering from food insecurity. We look forward to learning more about how we can improve our food systems to be less wasteful and more equal. But first, my name is Sam and co-hosting this session with me today is Elise. Hello. Hello. And let's welcome Ambrit to the show. Thank you. So my first question to you, Ambrit, is um, Skalde Café. What is it that you do there and how did you get started with the café? Um, what we do there is... A complex question because we actually do a lot of things um which means i'm gonna go back to how we started it mm, it's a good story too <laughs> to get to the story of what we're actually doing now um it's uh, in 2013 i started as a dumpster diver not for the reasons that a lot of others started uh, i had a lot of guinea pigs they eat a lot of vegetables <laughs> 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 and i saw this uh, tv show uh, with these uh, chefs who um, did a three-course meal from leftover food. And I thought, hey, that's a good way to fi- get vegetables for my guinea pigs. <laughs> Were you cooking three-course meals for your guinea pigs? No. Okay. I, lived with, I was unemployed, uh, struggling with some illness, uh, and lived with my parents at that time, uh, trying to get back on my feet from all of what... I was struggling with mm. depression, uh, not knowing what the illness was that I had. Uh, later, I found out I had narcolepsy mm. uh, and Asperger's syndrome. And those two don't go well together. But uh, the narcolepsy, I can get medication for. Mm. So now I'm like a stable person who can do, who can do a lot of things. <laughs> um, but I lived with my parents and had a lot of guinea pigs. And then I went to Facebook and searched for uh, groups for dumpster divers to find someone who could uh, teach me how to dumpster dive. And when I went out, out dumpster diving with uh, the person I found, I found out there were a lot more food in these dumpsters than what my guinea pigs were going to eat. <laughs> so I took it home and my parents were like, we don't need that. We have money. What are we, why? <laughs> why are you taking this into the house? It's disgusting. So I started giving it to um, one of my friends because her economy was not the best. And then suddenly her freezer was full and I still kept bringing home food that I didn't know what to do with. So I went on Facebook again, found these Facebook groups where people that did not have a lot of money were asking for help. Mm. And I started giving out food to people with a low income and people who were struggling one way or the other and who, who couldn't go out dumpster diving themselves. Um, then I met a guy who were uh, talking about starting a network of dumpster divers throughout the country who wanted to do some organized food sharing of uh, uh, dumpster dived food uh, in order to help the families who couldn't go out dumpster dive themselves. Mm-hmm. So we did that, started up that network, and that's how I actually ended up in Aarhus, because first I lived in northern Jutland, then I met him, I moved in with him. And then the authorities found out that we were dumpster diving and giving food away, and they called me and they said, come into the office, we want to talk about this. Oh, <laughs> someone's in trouble. Was this the police then? Or was no, this, uh, uh, the, the, the food authorities, making sure that everyone follows the rules. Yes. Right. 
So they said, come into the office. We need to have a talk about this. <laughs> so I went into the office and they said, listen, we do find that what you're doing is a good cause. However, it's not legal. You cannot just give food out to people without being um, registered as a business. So it wasn't the dumpster diving that was illegal. It was the giving It was the giving the food away. away yeah. you're, li- you're allowed to dumpster dive, but you're not allowed to give food away without being registered. And in order to be registered, the food can't be d- dumpster dived. But so can you dumpster dive for a community as well? You know, like... Is it possible to dumpster dive on behalf of somewhere else, someone else, or is is that already illegal? You are not, you are not allowed to dumpster dive on behalf of someone else. There is there is a uh, you can give food away ten t- times a year, something like that, um, before you have to register as a business. But like, I mean friends like no give food so Can't, not even your neighbor you n- no. not even your neighbor like no. elise cooked for us the other day like if she does that 10 more times then she with dumps oh yeah no with food right like no, but that's a different thing so it's with dumpster that's a specifically. completely different thing okay mm. we're talking about i'll get to that because i was talking to the authorities in their office and what they said was but you cannot give it out to people but if you take it to them and cook it together with them in their kitchen, then it's okay. And I was like, strange. What? <laughs> so if I cook it together with them, then I can give it to them. And went home, looked in the law, and thought, okay, it doesn't say it has to be my kitchen. Or it doesn't have say it has to be their kitchen. It can also be in my kitchen. So we did a brainstorming on that one. Said, okay, let's build a kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, why not? <laughs> Just in the <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> so we uh, went out and uh, we had this uh, this trailer, like the ca- where you go on camping with, where they ha- they have these uh, small stuffs in them that goes on gas. Uh, the trailer completely ruined, couldn't r- go anywhere, but the small stuff still com- uh, in complete and still usable. So we took it out, rebuilt it. And around that, we built a kitchen that we could take out on a trailer in, and put it up in a park under this big tent mm. and put up tables and chairs and barbecue and a sink, water, everything that we needed. And then we took all the dumpster dive food and put it up next to it. And then we said, come in and cook with us. Come cook, yeah. <laughs> we have a kitchen. Come and cook with us. <laughs> um the first time we did it was in 2014, summer 2014. And there were uh, around 120 people the first time. <laughs> and wow. I mean, we just thought, this might be a good idea. Let's try it. Mm. See what happens when we put up a tent and a kitchen in the middle of Aarhus. And did p- how did people find out about it? Was it Facebook or did they just see it you? It was it was it was everyone's summer holi- holiday, which means there yeah. were a lot of people in Aarhus. The mm. weather was good, and there was a big white tent in the middle of a park. Do you need permission for this tent as well? Or? Yeah. We need we need a permission to use the space from the municipality. They have this platform where you can book a park in Aarhus, and then you can use it for the whole day. So we did that. Um, and that was basically the permission we needed, because as long as we cooked the food together, <laughs> it was within We're the private sphere, yeah. yeah. and <laughs> we didn't need any other permission than that. None that. Um, and we just wanted to see if it was a good idea and if people liked the idea. And with 120 people the first time, we thought, okay, we are onto something here. So we did it again in the same park. And then uh, I think it was P4, the radio, stopped by, did an interview. And after that, I don't think we did any more events on our own. People started calling and saying, hey, we're going to make this event. Do you want to come and join us? And uh, we can do it together. And it was still within the private sphere doing it together with other people. So we were cooking together in the events that other people made. Um Obviously, the authorities found out. 
<laughs> called me again. Uh, I was just a few, after, a few months after where I started. It was uh, in uh, Aarhus Festu. Mm. We were putting up in Rådhusparken. The mm. They called me and said, listen, you cannot do that. You cannot just do what you're doing. And I said to it was the same person I talked to. And I, I said to her, well, you said that if we cook the food together with people, we're allowed to do it. The concept is like this. We cook it together with the people that come on the day. And then she went really quiet. Oh, well, <laughs> I guess I did say that. <laughs> and then realized she was like, oh, but then I can't stop you. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's where we started with cooking together with people. Um, and the, the initiative became really, really popular. And we were calculating at some point that we were doing one and a half event per week with this setup wow. where we, and, and every time we did an event, it was like three days, for, uh, one day of prepara- preparation and dumpster diving, the next day putting up the tent which use, and the kitchen, which usually took two hours, and then doing the event and then taking it do- all down again, which again took two hours. And then the day after unpacking, uh, getting rid of the leftover food. There was always a lot of uh, leftover food because we never got rid of it all during the event. So we had to find a way to get rid of it somewhere else, which was also a problem at that time. But there were three, three day events for just one day events, really. It was and it, it was getting really hard for the volunteers uh, to do one and a half event uh, like this. Um, so we had to find a solution where we could have a place in Aarhus where we could be and have events and so we didn't have to get the mobile kitchen out as much as we were doing so we started talking to the municipality about is it a possibility to find somewhere in Aarhus where we can do something put something up and uh, they found an empty space in Kalkværksvej um, where they said, okay, you can be here for a few years because we don't know yet what's going to be built there. And about the same time, the CARES pilots contacted us. And they said, listen, um, we're going to go do a school project together with an organization in Aarhus. We have uh, this idea with these public fridges. And we wanted to uh, ask if you want to be part of the school project and do it together with, with us. And we could see that when we did the events... And all the surplus food we had after that, that could actually be a solution for us to get rid of that in those public fridges. Mm. So we thought, great idea. Let's do it. Maybe could you explain for the people who don't know what Chaos Pilots is? Uh, just so Chaos Pilots uh, is an education. Um, and I actually don't know that much about the education, but I know that they do a lot of different uh, community projects and activism related studies things like that um, it's an sort of an alternative education you can take but it does uh, educate a lot of pro- project leaders and things like that um, so these students did all the work with setting up the first public fridge we made the fellowship at Free Fridge Aarhus, which was at that time just one fridge and a cupboard for dried foods. Mm-hmm. And then uh, after they had done their school project with it, like registering and maintaining and finding out how to run it and things like that, they left it to us so we could continue running it. And as we could see that this was actually... Maybe a better idea than what they had thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, we expanded first with uh, another fridge and then with two fridges more. And now we're up to seven fridges along with the initiative having started as Free Fridge uh, Copenhagen and Free Fridge Culling. So it's actually spreading out to other places in Denmark now. Then we had to move from Kalkværksvej 
because they were going to be built. And the municipality gave us a place in Jægårdsgade, and then we had a lot, lot of funds. Well, as the project got more and more popular, uh, there were also funds f- who started wanting to actually give us money. Mm. Because in the beginning, when no one knew what the idea was, we were having trouble. Even the municipality was like, you are going to be doing what? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> it's it's like they had to see the idea before actually figuring out that that was actually a good idea. But did they not believe it was necessary here in Aarhus? Or like, what, what do you think the hesitations were? I remember uh, when we first got the idea. We went and talked to uh, the chairman, uh, the, the the head of uh, the, the social department in the municipality, uh, Thomas Medum. We went and talked to him about this idea that we had. That was before we did it all. Sitting in his office saying, we have this idea. We think it's a great idea, but we need a location for it. And he was like, yes, but there are a lot of organizations who like locations, and we don't have that much space to just give out and I'm not sure what it is that you actually want to do and you're not started yet and and I remember and that is what I remember the most from that meeting with him he said but I believe that there should be room for some anarchism interesting that's, that, that's that for me that was like what did he mean by that to go out and uh, do something ourselves, like something less we official. Or we didn't need the municipality and their approval, and their we had to just go out and do it. So in in a way, he was kind of giving you like a green light, a green light yeah. to just take charge of it and then do what we wanted. I think that's like, quite cool. Like. But to hear a politician say that, that was <laughs> for me just strange. But just also really like wow he's a politician and he says that (laughs) okay (laughs) let's do it so he was like do it and he was also actually the one who a few months later gave us the uh, the the Aarhus Taga award for Mm. the same project Mm. so obviously he was backing the idea but uh, because we weren't started yet, he wasn't sure he could just give us a location. So he wanted us to show that this could actually work and that this was actually a livable idea. In b- before he started showing his his support, but he has been supporting us all the way after that. It's like he needed the like to to make it more official. He needed the proof that. He needed it us to show him that it was a good idea. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. He probably couldn't publicly support it if you didn't have that no, proof. But we have had a lot of support from him after that. Also because there were I was unemployed at the time. We started it. And at some point the job center said to stop doing it because it wasn't making me self employed. It was self you know. Mm. Mm-hmm. Were you on? Uh, were they saying that you couldn't get a casa if you? I I've uh, I've never been uh, able to get a casa because I went from uh, the university to being ah, ill to right. being unemployed to still being unemployed. Right, and you need to have worked a year. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I've I I I had never worked before this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been uh, unemployed for fourteen years before this, struggling mm. with I- my illnesses. Um. And at some point, you just get bored being unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we started doing something like this. And then when the job center said that we should stop doing it because it wasn't leading anywhere and we had to go out find real work. Mm. Real work. Real yeah. <laughs> work. Air quotes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. At the same time, in the same department in the mus- municipality, there was this meeting where people were talking about initiatives and projects and Someone said, Skrælle Caffeine, that's the best project ever. How do we get more of that? And we're like, we've just been told to stop and now we want more of it? Really? 
So we sent uh, Thomas Medum a mail again and said, listen, you have just had this experience with your people, the one in his department. We need to find out what, how to solve this. And he was like, yes, come to my office. And he had put up a nice table with uh, coffee cups and cookies. And then he called the chef of, uh, or the, what is it called? Boss. The, the director of mm. the job center and a few other high people. And then he said, listen, I can find uh, 200,000 in, uh, in my budget. And uh, then you'll get them through the system fast. And then they can be employed in the project, in a flex job, and then that's all. <laughs> so um, the the director of the job center went back to all uh, the social workers on our, on our cases and said, listen, this is how we're going to do it. And after that, it was just... So they left you alone after that. Yes. <laughs> and it went really, really fast from there, uh, getting through uh, the visitation for flex job. And now I'm employed pr- pretty much by myself. Mm-hmm. As an NGO, As an NGO. director? No, well. because the thing is I can't be the chairman of the NGO because I'm in a flex job. There are some rules to that. <laughs> it's, it's seriously strange. You can't um, be your own boss when you're in a flex job. There are some laws. Okay. I guess <laughs> we'll probably to... end up talking about some of these laws because uh, yes. you, you know quite that, a lot that, about that's, it. <laughs> that's why we started it as an NGO with a board committee uh, who could then employ me into the project I started. And also my uh, boyfriend at that time, uh, but he's not in the project, project anymore. He uh, left when we split apart. So now I'm kind of running it all on my own but uh, the the constellation with being an NGO with a board um, I think is more making it more stable because then not everything is on me suddenly mm-hmm. I have a board of people who are equally in, engaged in the project who also wants to help solve all the, the issues that shows up there was a, there was a lot of um, like a lot of lo- a lot of difficulties getting to the point where we are now. A lot of things that had to be solved uh, in order for the whole project to be able to develop. Because we kept running against walls that were like trying to be, mm-hmm. be setbacks on the project. Mm-hmm. So that um, we, we, I, I, I can't. I have given up counting how many times I was close to giving up because I was like, okay. Another road on the on another block on the road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, also, um, like, it's amazing that you were able to um, to start this without um, like having really help from anyone, and not, or it seems like you know all odds were against you. We, and we started with zero economy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the only thing we had was that small stuff from the camping trailer and then food from the dumpsters. Mm -hmm. That was basically what we started with because there was no money at that time and we were unemployed. Obviously, we couldn't put money into the project to start it. And without, with just an idea, it was difficult. It was just difficult getting anyone to uh, invest in the project. Um, The thing is, when people start an initiative, there are two ways to do it a lot of people start the wrong way which is they sit down and say hey we have this idea let's calculate how much money we need to start it and then they calculate we need half a million one million something like that and then they start uh, writing fund applications and keep being rejected again and again and again and again because they haven't proved yet that the idea is good. Mm. They only have an idea. And the f- there are a lot of funds who don't want to invest in something that is unsecure. Mm-hmm. But if you start off by showing that your idea is good. I remember uh, not long after we had started, I actually had the first fund call me 
asking for bank detail, details just wow. so they could give us money. I was like, okay, but I, we haven't written, written an application for your fund. You just want to give us money? <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then it's like, wow. That's a nice surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, they called me and said, hey, we have chosen you to be part of our uh, uh, fund giveaway this Christmas. What's your bank details? It's like, <laughs> okay, thank you. I think <laughs> so. That was the easiest uh, fundraising I ever did. <laughs> I was just picking up the phone. <laughs> so, yeah. That, but, that's it, but it's a shame because sometimes you really, you do need some money to start out a project. I mean, everything costs money, yeah, basically. A lot, of, a lot of and people think you do. But mm. that depends what you want to do because a lot of things you can just reuse. Mm. Yeah. I mean, start with what you have instead of what you think you need. But mm. that's a common... Uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying misconception, but like I would agree with the least is that the the idea is that like if you have an a project, you need some cash, and I think you've proven pretty amazingly mm. how that doesn't need to be true. Yeah, but mm. I can imagine so many people being but if, if demoralized. But if you start your mm. project off by looking at what you have and saying, "What can I do with this? How can I start a project from what I have?" Mm -hmm. instead of saying, "I want to do this project, and for that I need to get this." Otherwise, I can't do it. Mm. Then build the project on what you have instead of what you need. Mm. And then it's about being as um, or having as much perseverance as you have had in this project. Obviously, <laughs> you <laughs> want to ask if <laughs> <laughs> you want you want to work for it and you want to fight for it and you want to really want it to happen. Otherwise, you're not gonna succeed in it. I mean, I could have given up ten million times doing along the way also because a year after that we got through with the flex job uh, thing and i got employed i was like whoa my first job ever <laughs> and then a year later i uh, got cancer oh i'm sorry and no, i was sorry. like but why I don't want to go back to the being sick and into the job center. Now I finally got a job. Mm. I don't. <laughs> so, um, obviously, the cancer was a setback as well. Um, luckily, I didn't get as ill from the chemotherapy as many people do. Mm. And halfway through the chemo, I actually decided I don't, didn't want to be on a sick leave anymore because I was bored and I wanted to get back to Skalgefin <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> and I couldn't be back bothered. to your baby. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I was just sitting at home waiting for it to be Tuesday or oh, Thursday so I could get out, 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 go out and get another chemo treatment and mm. then go home and wait a week and I was like, this is just boring. I want to get back to work. So now I don't want to be on sick leave anymore. I'm gonna go back working, <laughs> and then the Thursdays and the chemo is just something in my calendar. Mm. So wow. that's really strong. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, I can say that's how much it meant to me um, because I got cancer again <laughs> a year what? later. Yes, um, and the worst part about the the cancer is that I had to be away from Skalkevin for a period of time to i was like i just don't have time for this mm. i mean so the 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 second time i was told i had cancer i cried not because of the cancer but because i was afraid i had to go through another chemo session which would take a lot of time and i just didn't felt like i have that had that time because there was mm. someone much, much else i wanted to do mm. so when they told me uh, that i only just had needed to have a surgery and then they would it they, it would hopefully be gone it's like yes <laughs> i don't need i'm not uh, having the chemo it's just surgery and then so it's like fix it and move on and then yes wow i'm really really bad at being being sick because i like my job so much <laughs> that all of that is just I mean, it Time makes sense, you, like you're doing some like really, really meaningful work, which I feel like not so many people can say that actually, like I, I think most jobs that people have, 
people feel like they're not actually meaningful to them. And also the the struggle to get to where you were to have set up this initiative right. with all uh, of the setbacks. Yes. I can, yeah, I, I can I've, understand. I've, I've, I've been saying that I'm probably the only person in Denmark who gets paid to jump around in dumpsters. <laughs> 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 but and and I, I know that I am a, a privileged person to have this job, and I know that I love a lot of other people would probably prob- probably love to have that job. Um, I don't know if anyone else could do this job because it's built around me as a person, just as much as it's built around the uh, the scholarly fame. Because when you do have Aspergers, you can't just fit into any job. Mm. Mm-hmm. You need to find a job that fits you. So, so my job has basically been built around me as a person, mm-hmm. so that it fits me, and I don't think it would fit anyone else. Mm. Um, but to get back to uh, what we actually do in Skalle Cafe, um, it is a constantly developing project. So we do a lot of stuff. Uh, we still do the cooking sessions where we cook together with people, and we also still have the fridges. We pick up food from twelve different stores each day, and are still every expand- day, every day, with w- with consent. So these stores, we have volunteers who go out to the stores, knock on the door, and then uh, the employees have uh, packed all the surplus food uh, on these uh, trolleys. And then they hand it to our volunteers who put it in the cars. So no more dumpster diving. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I still do dumpster diving just for the fun of it. <laughs> uh, also because I want to still like feel I'm in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that's where I started with the dumpster diving. Mm. Always go out dumpster diving on first of January. That's a tradition. Oh. <laughs> Because everyone are having hangovers and I'm not, so I get it all to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and would you say the food that you pick up, h- how much is it to w- that people listening can have a feel for feel for how much surplus food grocery stores have every day? From the well, that also depends what day it is, um, and also if it's. Uh, around the holidays, like the Christmas holidays, we had this uh, big sharing where we brought in over 10 tons in one day. Uh, but on 10 tons. 10, 10 tons. 10 tons. Yeah, that had to sink in for a second. I was yeah. just like, oh, 10 tons. Wait, 10 tons? <laughs> 10 tons, yeah. Like <laughs> in, a heavy in, car in, is in, a ton. In like one day, yes. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. In one day? In one day. 10 tons from from 12 supermarkets? No, no, no. That was uh, the, the Christmas sharing where we had made... Uh, um, Deals with all the stores that have closed during the Christmas and got all their leftovers. Mm. So that was a little extra. Okay. So red cabbage and potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas cookies. Oh. A lot of Christmas cookies. <laughs> Yummy. I'm not sure what I'd do with three tons of Christmas cookies. Uh, <laughs> eat them. Like, yeah. And I, e- I even had a call uh, after Christmas from one of the stores that were supposed to be called before Christmas and we heard nothing from them. And they called me after Christmas and they said, hey, uh, I also picking up after Christmas. And I was like, yeah. Okay, we have a lot of Christmas cookies. Do you want to come and get it? And they were close to my uh, my doctor and I had to go to the doctor anyway. So I was like, sure. <laughs> I come in tomorrow. <laughs> I have an appointment at, with the doctor. So I went to the doctor and then I went to the store afterwards. And there were like three pallets of cookies. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and then they came and said, do you also take... Uh, uh, food that's due date it's like sure what do we have and they came with half a pallet of cola uh, the possibilities are endless with cola it's always more things to do uh, but yeah so w- what else are you guys doing at Scala Cafe is there anything else you want to share about it apart from the, the fridges and uh, the cooking sessions where, we, where people can come in and cook together uh, the, the kitchen is an open kitchen so people can come in from the street and be part of it, which also means that the, the homeless people who don't have a kitchen to cook anything in, either they can go to the shelter and have whatever is served, or they can come in and cook f- something together with us f- 
for themselves and be part of a community, which will, will also help them stay away from the bad communities. Mm-hmm. We have this uh, young guy who came to us from the homeless shelter. Now he's rarely there anymore because he is in our place and that has really helped him grow mm. as a person. Um, we also do uh, workshops for uh, school classes. Um, and we do uh, birthday parties and we do uh, all sort of sorts of things that has something to do with food and with uh, educating people uh, either in regard to food waste or in regard to we have done some plant-based workshops where we cook plant-based uh, but still from surplus food which means that we suddenly bring two different uh, subjects together with the surplus food and the plant eating more plant based. Um, we d- we do a lot of of uh, educational sessions in different ways. Also, t- uh, learning people about what it's like to to uh, not have a lot of money and be dependent on something like this. Uh, even mm. the uh, our neighbors are, are uh, the homeless organization. And they have these poverty walks where the homeless take people out on tours to show them what it's like to be homeless in Aarhus. And all of these tours starts in front of all fridges to show people uh, that our initiative is actually a really important part of being homeless in Aarhus. Mm. Um, because we make it easier for the homeless to survive. Um, so we have a lot of uh, work like work together with them in order to to teach people what the possibilities are when you hit the bottom. Mm-hmm. So you redistribute surplus food while at the same time also helping uh, vulnerable, pe- vulnerable people in society and then at the same time also um, helping to change the culture with education programs and workshops. Ba- basically, uh, we see food waste a lot. We see dif- food di- waste differently from what other people see it. Um, when you look in the media, uh, there are a lot of this food waste is something that has to be stopped. We see it as food waste is a resource, and it's a tool, and we are just using it wrong. Uh, we don't necessarily have, we don't we shouldn't see food waste as an isolated problem mm. because it is actually something that we can use to solve a lot of other problems with so instead of just saying it has to be stopped we should see what we can use it for in other parts of our society like mm. what do you mean like uh, people with uh, a low income they are ba- they are in need of it so we can use it as a resource and a, a tool to give them a better living standard. Um, we can also uh, use it as uh, for teaching purposes because it's surplus food. It's already been thrown out. So if you have kids coming in to learn m- about more uh, uh, environmentally correct cooking, what do you call it? Plant-based cooking, basically. It doesn't matter if they fuck it up when they cook. Because mm. it's already been thrown out once, <laughs> so it can be used as a uh, as a cooking tool for kids instead of having to go out and buy a lot of food that they can experiment with in order to learn to cook plant based food. Mm. Food you take something that's been thrown out thrown out any- anyway. You don't have to like pay for it, and they can experiment with it all they want, and suddenly it has a purpose instead of just being waste. Mm. But um, do you see this as a temporary fix to uh, the current system that we have? Because we waste, uh, everyone always hears this, one third of uh, food that's produced is wasted. And obviously we can't sustain that um, type of production and consumption. So, I mean, it's really important that, um, that we also change the 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 whole system and culture of food waste too at the same time this is this is something i talk with uh, selena Yule about a lot 
uh, I don't know if for those who do not know who Selena is, she is like the food activist, like the biggest food activist in the world, basically. Uh, she is uh, the one who started the the stop food waste uh, mm. with the with the small yellow stickers mm-hmm. you see in the supermarket. She's the one starting mm-hmm. that for mm. many years ago. Uh, had a lot of awards for her work, and she is a big reason why the food waste in Denmark has gone down with 25%. That's a lot of her work. And is the reduction then from the retail side or the household side or the the farming side? Um, I think uh, mainly the stores okay. are responsible for 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 the main part of that reduction uh but also the the households do have uh a little part of it as well and, and she start she was the one who started putting focus on food waste uh from the production to the retail to the household all over the line uh and she was the one who got people to actually Think about the food waste. Yeah, so she pushed it into the she, she is, the faces yeah, of people. Yes, yeah, so exactly. that's the, that the important first step yes, with any the, kind of the, social the, issue. The important first s- step to put awareness on it. Yeah. So so she's she's basically the main reason why there is so much focus on it now, and more and more people have started talking about food waste and doing something about it. And and from she started on, until now. It has been reduced with 25%. That's great. Very impressive. Ro- yeah. Rome wasn't built in one day, <laughs> but <laughs> that is still a f- fair. Um, I mean, we need, mm. as, and as I said, we talk about this a lot. We need to accept that we cannot stop food waste completely. It's always going to be there. But of course, there's Somehow. like a difference between avoidable food waste and unavoidable food waste. And right now we just, like even... In Denmark, uh, even with this reduction, we still waste, what was it, 840,000 tons uh, last year of um, and ho- edible food the, waste. And the household is still very bad. responsible for the majority yeah, of it. Yeah, for about 40% about, I think. I think they have even, I think the household might even have, they were one third, uh, uh, they had one third of the responsibility a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And now they've gone to forty percent mm-hmm. because of the reduction in food and waste from retail. My thought is that something like too good to go, mm-hmm. uh, and this is only a thought I've had. Uh, I do like too good to go as a concept, but I can also see a lot of people. There is a Facebook group for too good to go, and I can see a lot of pe- people who complain about what they get in those bags, mm. but for, because too good to go is like a lucky bag, mm-hmm. and. You buy something without knowing what it is, and you might get something you don't like. Mm, or can't eat if you're oh, vegetarian. Yeah, exactly. But and I see a lot of people complain about this in the group and saying, ah, that wasn't what I wanted. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, but then you should maybe not have bought a lucky bag. You yeah, mean, and that, go- and that goes to waste, you mean? I think, I think uh, that might have something with, to do with it, because there are people buying lucky bags who don't necessarily need to buy these bags with cheap food. And when they get something they they don't like or they don't eat, or then they throw it out because it was cheap. And and also the yellow stickers and when things are on offer. And pe- my concern is we might just move the food waste from the stores to the households mm-hmm. with these uh, cheap priced offers. Because there is a tendency, and it's a human thing, but it, there is a tendency that when you see something that is cheaper than normal, then you hoard it because it's cheap and you can save it for... <sighs> we have this survival instinct that makes us collect things for worse days. Mm. Like we need to survive. It's always in the back of our head. We need to survive. So we have a ten- tendency of hoarding. Mm. Basically, everyone has this as part of their nature because we're humans. And when we see uh, reduced prices, we tend to buy it all because it's cheap. 
and then end up in our fridge and we're like okay i might not be able to eat it all before it goes bad maybe it was stupid i bought it all mm-hmm. but it we don't think it think about it at the time we see it because it's reduced price so i think there is my concern is that, that these reduced prices even though it's a good idea it end up as food waste in the households mm-hmm. sometimes yeah i mean and that's why like you said you can't just look at food waste as a as one isolated problem it's also part of a whole culture of one um not knowing um how to tell if a food is actually bad or not uh to not knowing how to uh recover food and use it in a, in a different way or properly preserve it in the freezer or something and then also just um a general culture of buying too much and then um not appreciating really the things that you've bought also i think it comes with a level of affluence if you have if you've never really had to um worry about money i think that um you don't really have the same appreciation for um food as a as a necessity because it has and, always and, been and, there and, and not just food it's we are a rich country uh, a lot of people in denmark don't what it don't know what it's like to not be able to buy what of obviously we do have poor people in Denmark but the majority still uh, don't really think think about that if if you can always just go out and buy a phone you can always just go out and buy new you can always just so so we mm. do have a lot of this uh, buy and use and throw out mentality like We can just throw out and buy new. Everything's disposable. Yeah. But then how do you, my question would be then, like how do you then uh, educate people or encourage people to start to value food maybe a bit more or a bit differently so then it's it's th- there's less household waste? I don't think you necessarily have to do it that way. I think you need to make people think about if they actually need what they buy. If when you see something in a with a reduced price, you have to think about if you actually need to buy it, just because the price is reduced. But it's it's so easy to fall into that trap. Like it even is. like, a, like and I've a had lot to of people yeah, do it. like I've had to really like when I was younger, I used to just if I saw a reduced sticker, even if I didn't want it, I'd buy it, and it really like I'd feel mm-hmm. like my brain was controlling me <laughs> to exactly. just even if I was like, oh, do, I, do I really want four packets of Doritos? Yeah, yeah, go on, go on, that's great. You really need this. I want four packets of Doritos. Yeah, me, yeah, me too now. That's a <laughs> yes. shame. Now, that is why I see the fridges that we have made as a solution to some of that. Because if mm-hmm. you buy four packets of Doritos and you find out you can only eat two of them, obviously you can go and put the other two in the fridge and someone else might want them. Yeah. The, you can also, t- sorry to interrupt, you can also like encourage that at a community level uh, i think it's it's fantastic that your organization exists and i think it's it will always be necessary because there will always be like i think we can certainly reduce waste uh at a systematic scale but there will be some overproducing or like some leftover in the farm or, or whatever um but i think you can encourage people to like if you don't think you can eat the food then you can give it to your neighbors or you know like yeah, but that is the thing you're not allowed to just give it to your neighbor because the law says if you give it to a neighbor more than 10 times a year then you have to be registered as a food business then maybe that's that maybe that's a good segue into um the laws because that's um i mean you're an expert in this and not and many people know about it because you'd never you never have to you're never confronted with these food laws unless you're maybe a corporation or retail uh like company so um so why is it that these uh let's just take this one for example why is it that you have this law that says you can only give food to your neighbor 10 uh 10 times a year We have we have this set of uh, laws around food businesses, uh, but they're very. It's like they don't really make 
space for um, they don't really make space for you as a private person uh, to do anything with your food other than throw it out they don't make space for the supermarkets to en- to do anything with their food then throw it out and the same basically goes for uh, the the producers because there are so many rules to what they are allowed to do with the food um, and these rules goes even for you as a private person because it says that they, they have the, this small limit as to what you can do as a private person you can I think it's either one or two meals and then you have to cook it as meals and one or two meals per week it, that you're allowed to give to someone else or um, uh, like a bigger amount of n- not uh, non-cooked food that you can give to someone else 10 times a year they keep cha- changing it but there is a limit to how much you're allowed to do as a private person Why? it's for s- some sort of security reason Uh, that if you start to di- distribute bigger amounts of food uh, without having some sort of control with it, there's a bigger risk of someone getting sick. I th- <laughs> also, yeah, that, that that seems absurd to me. Um, um, no, yes. Like obviously, it, you it need some kind of protection. I think of they food, are. I think they are being overprotective, and I think our laws are lacking some flexibility. Um, i think I think our laws are lacking some flexibility as to if we want to f- uh, do something about the food waste, there need to be more flexibility in the laws so that we can experiment with possibilities and and new ideas and find other ways to to fight food waste than the options we have now because the options we have now are basically none. Mm. I mean there are a few like what we're doing, but we are still under a lot of rules that we have to follow i am still fighting with the authorities now <laughs> because we have now we have the fridges and they, there's no law on having fridges standing in the middle of nowhere <laughs> which means <laughs> the authorities are confused <laughs> it shows how unique <laughs> a scale cafe is i mean it's, it's it's like moving in in a gray zone this because If you do something in a new way that hasn't been done before, all of a sudden the authorities are like, there has to be laws for what you can do. And now you've done something that we don't have a law for. So now we don't want know what we should tell you that you're allowed to or not allowed to. And mm-hmm. I, I, I'm first they suddenly showed up. They have these um, like a patrol that comes right. out unannounced to control mm-hmm. um, and they <laughs> saw the fridges and they looked at the fridges and like what <laughs> 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 and the only thing they said was but you have to be registered and I was like but we are a community that cooks together and we have been told that we can do that and they were like yes but you have a storage facility And those fridges. The fridges are the <laughs> storage they were, they were facility. Like, but but there, were no, <laughs> there were no rules for it. So they were, they were like, you have to be registered, but we're not sure what you have to be registered as because they are fridges outside. Outside. Yeah. And then we had a, had a lot of talk with them. really nice guys, these. <laughs> had, had a talk with them, and they really wanted to find a way that we <laughs> could sort this out. And they said... If you just register as a storage facility, we think that's the correct way. <laughs> <laughs> so they also weren't entirely sure because of the gray area. Yeah, it was a gray area. But then we're like, okay, you're storing food in a fridge. And yes, then someone comes and takes it. But it's still maybe just a storage facility. So if you just register as a storage facility, then we think that's okay. <laughs> So we are basically registered as a storage facility. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which, <laughs> which, which I think having heard of, of what you guys do there is not a very accurate <laughs> description of 
But what else would you... I, I think it's hard to define for sure, I mean, but... But I mean... We do, uh, we store food in a fridge. Yeah. I mean... So... Isn't every building a storage unit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's dive deep Let's have a philosophical <laughs> discussion then, about what then, is it. A... Then when we knew, moved to the new address, we had to be re-registered. And then they had to come and make this startup control visit. The authorities to see if we were registered correctly and doing things correctly. Um, and they came into the kitchen and they started asking questions about what we were doing in the qu- kitchen and uh, uh, what it had to, was going to be used for. And it turned out that that was in order to find out if the kitchen had to be registered as well. And because then it needed an approval for being a production kitchen, uh, which means that there are a lot of rules suddenly we would have to follow in regard to cleaning and things like that. So when I started talking about all the workshops we do and the cooking sessions and things like that, I said, oh, then it hasn't, doesn't have to be registered because that's like a community thing. And then we looked. they looked at our big storage facility where we keep the things we use in the kitchen and like that. And because it's being used in the kitchen, that doesn't have to be registered either. So it was only... The seven fridges that had to be registered. The only part of our organization that is actually registered as a food business. Because it's not a community Mm -hmm. thing. It's the fridges. But because there are no laws in regard to it. We kept arguing about what the rules were in Mm. order to have these fridges. And these people that came out were uh, different ones from the ones that were the first time. And they kept saying that you cannot have the fridges like that. I had a mail from them uh, before they came to visit saying you cannot have the fridges like that because it's open. And I emailed them back saying, okay, but can you show me where in the law it says how I can have my fridges Mm -hmm. uh, so that I know what rules to follow? No response back Mm. on that email. Uh, Then they came and visited. And again, I asked, can you show me where in the law it says how I can have my fridges so that I know which rules I have to follow? And then they say to me, "Uh, there are no laws, but we have this intern document that uh, we uh, should, that we can give you advice from. And in this in this intern uh, document is for um, these uh, road shops, uh, roadside shops, uh, small shops standing beside the road that has to be closed, like in a closed shed. And I'm like, but we're not a shop like that, and it's only. It's, it's mainly fruits and vegetables that we have. So what about those? S- you have these small sheds standing next to the road where people have berries and stuff. Mm, They're yeah, open. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. is that illegal if our f- fridges cannot stand like they are? Yeah. Because what they said was that, but what about rats? And I'm like, but it's a fridge. <laughs> it's closed. It's closed. <laughs> <laughs> like... Uh, a fridge is probably more secure against rats than a wooden shed would be. Yeah. But what about lions? You know, you've got to think <laughs> of all these things. Like, <laughs> like what about Darth Vader? And then, then, they start, then, then they started, well, can't you just build a front in front of the fridges with a door so, pe- so, so that people can walk in? I'm like, but if they leave the door open to that, the rats are going to get in anyway. And if we build an, an, a closed front, we're going to have drug users sitting in there fixing is that going to be hmm. more hygienic it's than it having it open? It mm. sounds like an absolute minefield, these laws that you have to mm. yeah, yeah. like acrobatically navigate through. Yeah. Navigate through yeah. But then, then, they al- then they also said that another solution was to put up a camera. So that we could keep an eye on... On the rats. <laughs> the rats. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like... But I don't want to put up a camera because then people are going to feel they are being 
what? Yeah, yeah the understandable. Time. Yeah. Um, but then we had uh, three times where people ruined the fridges, pulled down the electricity, and what? Really? Yes, they've been ruined three times in a few mm. months, and then we ended up uh, getting a donation of a camera. Mm. So now we have a camera, and didn't have to build a closed front because we have a camera. Mm. I haven't noticed that camera. Is it like hidden in a? <laughs> No, it's very it high up pitches. on the wall uh, across the street from the Oh, okay, okay. So, but okay. I don't think anyone is going to notice it because it's just sitting like really high up on the mm. wall. Yeah. But it's watching the, mm. the fridges and hopefully the authorities are going to accept that solution because they did suggest it themselves mm-hmm. at the time. But you have no way of predicting the response that you're going to get for all of these interpretations of laws that don't apply to your to your organization. No, and and I think that is stupid that they can come to me and say, but we have this intern document that you have to yeah. follow, but you even if you don't have access access to it. That, but that like uh, yeah, I don't know Danish law well it's enough. Bit, I actually sent an email to uh, uh, one of my I'm in a political party myself, so I obviously sent a, an email to Christiansborg to one of the politicians uh, saying, listen, can this be true that I have to follow some rules that I don't have access to? Can I just do that? So he's looking into it for me. Mm, that's good. But um, I wanted to say, well, I wanted to mention that you said earlier that there is no flexibility in the Danish law. And right now, Danish food law is written for private businesses, not for NGOs like yourself or your like your organization, Skala Caffeine. And um, um, I wanted to talk about ways that we could sort of um, like move forward. And something that I came across and wanted to get your thoughts on was um, in some in some places of the world, they've made, um, uh, what are they called? Some kind of like dialogue group where all the different stakeholders can come together um, um, to recommend changes to the food law so that it isn't just, you know, um, the so that the food law doesn't just pertain to one subsection of society. Yeah, they were called food policy councils. Is that something that does Aarhus or Denmark have something like that? Or is that something, and if not, is that something you could imagine uh, might help? We actually in Denmark have a food waste think tank, which uh, Selina is part of. Mm-hmm. What was that called again? Uh, it's a, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, yeah, I think... Uh, but it does. I exist. know which one it's a food yeah. waste think tank, um, and I know that Selena has uh, one of the things she is trying to get through it is a uh, food waste foundation, which uh, NGO NGO can uh, apply for to get finances for food waste projects. Uh, she's not get really getting anywhere with that because the the chairman of this think tank has this idea that all the solutions in regard to food waste is in the science and not in the NGOs. It's in the science. Science. So Uh, what kind of science, I guess? I have no idea. Okay. (laughs) But that (laughs) is apparently an idea that someone in the think tank has, that all the solutions should be found in science. It seems Uh, like a problematic solution is to to only lock yourself on one solution. Yeah. Yeah, when obviously yeah. something like Scala Caffeine is already doing uh, so much with redistribution and exactly. education. Exactly. The, uh, the more focus we have on the food waste, the more of these NGOs are popping up. Mm. And what I've seen, obviously, being one of the oldest in food waste NGOs in Denmark, if not the oldest food waste NGO, apart from the one Selena has, maybe... Uh, what I've seen over the years is that people have the good inten- intentions when they start. They have the, the will to do something. They start an NGO. 
but due to the lack of finances and with the the work that is in it without having uh, anything to support that work everything has to be run by volunteers at some po- point they just like get tired and they stop because running an NGO only on uh, volunteers is not very easy uh, no. <laughs> but if there are some finances into it and someone like in the Skrælde Café there is someone employed to actually run the NGO there is a foundation to build it on because that person who's employed isn't just suddenly gonna walk away uh, volunteers have the freedom to just stop and walk away when they get tired but an employed person can't just quit and go there's always going to be a foundation to to have the project project based on. Uh, and I think that is one of the main reasons why a lot of these NGOs end up dying again. Mm-hmm. So many people have tried and failed because there's just no funding for it. And a lot of the funding uh, options available will always say we don't cover operations yeah, exactly. like Lyft. We will only cover projects. Yes, like. and then there are also the 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 bigger foundations. They s- often support either the food bank or they support WeFood. And when they say, "But we have already supported these, so we don't need to support another initiative." Right, because so. food waste is not a problem anymore. <laughs> we have already su- supported the big organizations mm-hmm. that work with with this problem, so we have already done ours. So, in my opinion, based upon what you guys have been saying, it's uh, largely a political problem because of the lack of funding, because of the lack of support, because of all these problems you've got with the law, and the lack of recognition of how how useful something like Skalda Cafe can be to a community when trying to deal with the problem of food waste. So it sounds like there's a lot of constraints in place to enact effective food law uh, in Denmark. And it sounds like you've already personally experienced these problems. As, as, as I see it, it would be possible to exper- experiment with more solutions, more cre- creative solutions, if we had uh, a part in the law that were considered NGOs like in 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 the in mm. the law uh, around the whole food area if we had part of that that uh, goes for NGOs uh, because as it is at the moment we have to follow the same laws as the uh, supermarkets and the producers uh, when you look at the law, there are a section for pr- the producers, there's one for restaurants, there's one for uh, uh, supermarkets and shops, and then there are the private household- households. Mm. But it's like there's lacking this NGO thing. Hmm. Um, but that's because uh, food waste NGOs is such a new thing that the awareness of a separate law for food waste NGOs just hasn't been there. And that may, makes it difficult for, for, for us as an NGO because we have to follow the same rules as the big organizations mm. who has a lot of money to get uh, the correct uh, um, environment for the food. And the employees to do all the checks. E- and Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, we as an organization, when we pick up food from a supermarket uh, and we put it out in the fridges, uh, the, the food is in our... Uh, possession for two, three hours maximum. So why should we follow the same control procedures as a supermarket who has it for several days Mm. when we only have it for a few hours before it is going out to the consumers? Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. We have to do all these control checks. But it's... it's, Sorry, it sounds like... um, It also sounds like the NGOs with frontline experience of the problems of food waste need to be involved also in like maybe in the way that Elise suggested earlier a decision making policy council you mean exactly yeah. uh, where you've got a, a process where every 
actor within the food system voices their uh, solutions or ideas of laws mm -hmm. to make it more I, i've had yeah. a, i've had a few talks or communications with uh, uh, carl valentin about this with an ngo ngo law um, he hasn't uh, picked as i mean he's uh, he's uh, a politician in uh, the government so he has a lot of work so he hasn't picked up on that one yet but we do have had some communications about it and he thought it to be a good idea to look into it at some point so i think i just need to raise some more awareness on it yeah. in order to, for him to actually push it into something i mean that's why it has to be um like there has to be a level of awareness among the public about it being a political issue like you talked about sam and um like we have to politicize the issue of food waste because um i think right now it's very individualized but it's a societal problem uh both environmentally and socially and also economically and um and if there isn't the will to change something and like the public awareness of um all of the challenges that you talked about today and but like um then politicians won't really give a shit unless their constituents are saying oh this is actually a problem that we care about i mean we really need we i think we need that food law uh, look through like really uh, we have we really need that flexibility into it so that NGOs like ours doesn't have to move in gray areas to find solutions mm -hmm. and then have to argue with the authorities in regard to if it's legal and not legal because we're doing something that no one else done has done before. We need the flexibility for NGOs to actually be able to experiment with solutions. Otherwise, the, the ideas are going to die before they even get anywhere because they're going to be Uh, strangled by laws mm -hmm. that will just kill 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 the fire yeah. that don't even apply to to their situation no, as well no. it, 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 there has to be a possibility to actually try new solutions for handling the food waste problem uh, not as something that should be stopped but as but to see what we can do with this as a resource uh in our society because food is a resource mm -hmm. it's something everyone needs so of course it shouldn't just be something we see as waste but as something we can actually use for the people in our society yeah it's also a resource that has a lot of negative externalities like if if there are large piles of food waste that decompose without enough oxygen then it's a big polluter for example for the environment and it's also like everyone knows that there are a lot of people in the world not necessarily in denmark but there are a lot of people in the world who don't have enough food so it's bizarre and absurd it's about 10 percent of the world population doesn't have enough food exactly yeah and so how can we possibly continue to sit by and have all these restrictions on food waste and Uh, not restrictions on food waste, but restrictions on positive policies that help solve the problem. Exactly. When we've got these these huge issues for humanity that are directly related. And and that and that is exactly the problem with no flexibility in the laws. The laws are so strict that and I know this I know I know I've talked with people in the supermarket business uh, and producers and They all, um, they all equally frustrated that there are s such huge limitations as to what mm. they can do with their food waste. It's not that they don't want; they do want to find the solutions, but it's the law that is stopping them from actually solving the problem with their own food waste. But it sounds like everyone agrees that there are solutions that need to be found and can be found. Yeah. But then, in your opinion, 
the law is just outdated. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and that's because when when you see the politicians to- talking about food waste, it's also all of these, like, we have to make it illegal for the supermarkets to throw out food. And as an NGO, as a leader of an NGO, I just sit and say, yes, the supermarkets do, would like to not throw out their food. But as long as the laws doesn't make it make them able to do much else than that, you cannot just say they are not allowed to throw it out because what should they do then? Yeah, we have the law. They changed the law in France. Yeah, we were just. Uh, I was just about to mention that. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people who do not live in France and just see it from the outside, they think that is the best idea. Maybe explain what you're talking about for the listeners. The, the the laws in France is that they are not allowed to throw out food. They have to give it to either uh, charity or animal food. Those are the options. Uh, a lot choose to give it to charity, which means that there are uh, in there was some at uh, I think it was uh, Southern University of Denmark who did uh, who looked into the the. Uh, problematics about this law in France and found out that a lot of the charity organizations were drowning in this food waste and suddenly it had become a waste problem for the charity organizations What? because the supermarkets in order to not be fined for throwing out food they always send uh, the 20% extra food that might be eatable when it was at the supermarket but had gotten rotten once it got to the charity organization so they were left with the supermarket waste and it became a financial financial problem for them to get rid of that waste wow. also the charity organizations got a lot more food than what they were able to use uh, in the organization and suddenly they had a lot of surplus food that got that would just go bad hmm. So it sounds like a law that was created to sound like effective policy without actually being effective yes. policy. A, a, a lot of these charity organizations end in a, ending up having to say no. They did not want that food because they were just not able to handle uh, the amounts of food they were getting and the amounts of uh, waste that were coming with it. Mm-hmm. So then uh, we only left with the possibility of giving it to animals. But what if, like, is it maybe just that there weren't enough NGOs or charities that were um, uh, able to deal with this um, project? Most likely, yes. There are not enough charity organizations. It, and it would be the same problem if we made that law in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Um, we would still have a law that said for an, a charity organization to be able to handle this food, they need to be registered as a uh, food business, which means that puts a limit to the number of uh, charity organizations who are allowed to actually uh, receive the food from the supermarkets. Something like uh, Møderhjælpen, they are not a registered food business, so they are not allowed to receive the food. Suddenly we have, a, mm. we have a limitations as to... Uh, who can receive this food, which means that this huge amount of food would have to be divided into a few numbers of charity organizations Mm -hmm. that would then be uh, left with a huge amount of food. Uh, And at the moment, we already have the food bank Mm -hmm. uh, who does a huge work on taking food from uh, the producers, uh, food that uh, has some sort of gone wrong in the production uh, maybe a wrong etiquette on it or uh, something like that and and they distribute it out to uh, homeless shelters and asylum centers and things like that which i think is really really great and they're doing huge work on on uh, fighting food waste from the produ- producers in that regard but when if they if these organizations also had to take the surplus foods from the supermarkets all of a sudden, then they would drown in mm-hmm. food just like the ones in France. 
Mm. They don't have the capacity to take on no. that food. So it sounds like in France, they made a mistake of not creating the infrastructure and law necessary to deal with this banning for the supermarkets to throw away their own food. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's not, I, I don't think it's too hard to imagine a system which would work. You just need to allow the NGOs and the charities to... to I, th- I think in, instead of just instead of making a law that's, that says you are not allowed to throw out your food, the law should be made in a way that says you are, uh, if possible, you should find someone to take the food. Instead of, instead of making like a, you are not allowed to, then making a, you should do something else and throw it out if it's possible. Law. Mm, but I mean, uh, maybe it also a problem is that we're overproducing food too. Because why is it that supermarkets have to be full all the time and overflowing with like the freshest vegetables? Because we're spoiled yeah. consumers. We are, yeah. I mean, if you go into a shop to buy bread, mm-hmm. you expect there to be 13 different kinds of bread on the shelves to choose from even if you only need one if you came into a shop where the bread shelves are almost empty and there are only two different kinds of bread to choose from and those two breads were not the one you wanted you're gonna do your shopping in a different shop Mm -hmm. because you expect there to be full shelves and a lot to choose from Yeah, so it looks like we're not going to be able to figure out the solution to food, the food waste problem uh, today. Um, and I think we actually need to start closing because, uh, yeah, otherwise we can end up talking about this for hours and I hours and hours. I can talk about this forever. <laughs> I have a feeling you can. <laughs> I mean, yes. there are so, it's, it's, a, so, it's such a complex area mm-hmm. um, with so many... Uh, solutions that no one has found yet. Um, that there, it's it's like uh, it's like an unexplored world of doing things that hasn't been been done yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are things that has to be solved first in order to get to actually experimenting with the solutions again. The laws that are rigid and the laws that are not, not existing. And then again, the finances for the solutions that haven't been found yet. Those are ba- practically the main three challenges to it. And then there are just all the other aspects of food waste and where the food waste is and what can be do- done in that part of the food waste uh, that area of the food waste like the consumers and the businesses and the producers and the restaurants we haven't even gotten around to the restaurants yeah. <laughs> there, so, there are lots of different topics about there food is waste. Yeah. food waste is just complex but it's i think it's good that at least in my short lifetime i've seen a growing awareness of yes. the food waste maybe because of your friend celine was yes. it yes she's uh she's been very influential maybe in in creating this as a problem that people are aware about instead yes. of just throwing away food and not thinking about it at all i feel like the number who then mm. are consciously thinking oh okay you know I, maybe i, I need to I, reduce I, i think the awareness also has to be on that be on the complexity of uh, of the food waste and that it is not easy to find the solutions because there are too many people who are just like stop food waste But how? I mean, it is easy to say someone else has to stop it instead of themselves coming with the solutions. I mean, that is actually why we started Skrælle Café. That is because instead of just standing up and yelling that someone had to do something, you're like, you okay, what can, what can we do about yeah. it? Yeah. yeah, and that's why we're really happy that you were able to come on today and like talk about these things, like these nitty gritty details about what actually needs to change and how you can actually get there. And um, hopefully 
some of our listeners, well, for sure, some of our listeners um, were able to learn a lot. I've been able to learn so much from this conversation. Me too. Yeah. So <laughs> thank lot. you so much. And <laughs> if there's can, any uh, can I, last thought. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the most important thing for me is that people have to change the way they think about food waste um, from waiting for other people to take action and waiting for other people to do something about it, about it to take action themselves and find the solution themselves. Because I think it is just as much a, a civilization problem and solution that does not necessarily have to be uh, based on what the politicians can do, but just as much uh, based on what uh, people with an activistic, activistic mind can come up with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's also a very useful lesson for, for any sort of activism as well, is instead of relying on other people to to solve these very complicated issues is to to maybe think what can I do to exactly to help because pol- the politicians can only make laws that's basically what they do they make laws they can just make laws about things so they can only tell you you cannot do this or you can do this they cannot come with the ideas and the solutions they have to come from the uh, civ- from people society. from the society yeah and if people want to um, take action and do something, how can they volunteer with uh, Skrælde Café? Uh, to volunteer in Skrælde Café, you basically just show up uh, <laughs> <laughs> and say, hey, can I help? Um, we are an open community and uh, people can just walk in from the street and be part of it. And there is uh, no one saying you have to be there this day or so many days or if you can only be there once or twice a month that's okay if you can be there every day that's okay too and if you can't lift heavy stuff then you can probably do something else so <laughs> there's always uh, there's always space for people who just want to take action and we are also uh, as I said, a constantly developing project so that if people come with some ideas that they think we should be part of or we should uh, try to investigate and see if it's possible, we are open to other people's ideas as well. Mm. Sounds amazing. Maybe I'll come along next week. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Is there anything uh, you'd like to plug or promote before mm. we close? No, I think we... <laughs> If I don't stop talking, I'm just going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for coming. It's it's really been like, I've, I've thought it was super interesting. Yes, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah me too. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. As a disclaimer, this was produced with the financial support of the European Union. Its contents are the sole responsibility of Our Food, Our Future and do not necessarily reflect the views of the European Union. We've got a lot going on here at Melafolklik Samwerk at Aarhus. We're a Danish NGO that works for a more just and sustainable world, collaborating with global partners worldwide as part of the ActionAid Alliance. Here in Aarhus, we have over 100 volunteers working together to to run a not-for-profit cafe and campaign and educate in areas ranging from feminism and climate justice to anti-discrimination and economic inequality to queer issues and refugee rights. You can come down to Cafe Mellonfolk every day, but Sunday for amazing food, drinks and events in a cosy cafe run by our lovely volunteers, including myself. (laughs) You can also get involved with our events, activities and campaigns and even running the cafe as a volunteer yourself. So check out Instagram and Facebook to find out more about our cafe and our campaigns by looking up Cafe Melonfolk or Melonfolk Lisa America Aarhus or following the links in the episode notes. And check out Podbean, YouTube and other podcast providers for more episodes, interviews and cool stuff details are in the episode description thank you everyone for listening and until next time